So this is highlights from the Nonprofit Technology Conference. Uh, the Nonprofit Technology Conference is put on by N10, which is the Nonprofit Technology Network every year. It's made up of about 1,500 professionals, you know, nonprofit tech people who come. Uh, this year it was in Minneapolis which it was very cold. We are in Houston, Texas right now, so we are not used to the snow. We were making snow angels on the street, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but um, so today we're going to talk about uh, some highlights, some trends we saw. We're going to recap some of our favorite presentations. And uh, our goal is to get through a lot of this. We know that we could spend all day talking about any one of these topics, and we're going to try to get through um, a lot of different topics and then give you resources to learn more. So I am Caitlin Kalucha. I'm QKate on Twitter. Uh, follow me or tweet me if you have any questions. Um, we've also got Sarah Worthy, who will be speaking in just a minute. She's Sarah M. Worthy on Twitter. And we are, here are our pictures. <laughs> so we are the Tendency Marketing Team. Tendency is an open source content management software that's built just for nonprofits. Um, so we went to the NTC to um, we work with a lot of nonprofits. We want to figure out kind of what trends, what's happening, how can we help our clients, how can we make the software better. So that's sort of why we were there and, and our um, kind of filter on things, <laughs> why we were there. And here are our pictures. So even though you can't see our faces, we hope to, you know, give you a little bit of, of our faces. So today we're going to talk about what is NTC, some resources. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about nonprofit tech trends, some trends that we saw in 2013, and also recaps of our favorite panels. And then we're going to end with some cool tools. One of my favorite things at NTC every year is the exhibit hall, where a bunch of different vendors and software companies and you know different resources all set up, and we get to walk around and see some new interesting tools that nonprofits are using that we're going to share. So what is NTC? I said, I mentioned before, NTC is uh, led by the Nonprofit Technology Network. Um, N10.org slash NTC is the URL. And we'll, um, when we post these slides, we'll include that. It's about 1,500 people. They bring in speakers from all over the country. Um, that's Beth Cantor over there on the left of this panel, who's one of the top nonprofit bloggers. Uh, you'll see lots of different people from big organizations, small organizations, bloggers, fundraisers, all kinds of different uh, people working in nonprofits, working with tech. So here are some resources. Uh, we took a bunch of photos while we were there. If you're interested in looking at photos, you can check out our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash tendency. Um, we are also posting our recaps. We've got a couple of blog posts and things up at tendency.com slash NTC hyphen 2013. Um, another resource is the, the NTC put together a group of Google Docs that are actually public Google Docs that anybody can add or edit or view. And they had one for each and every session. So that link, that n10.org slash NTC slash notes is actually kind of the repository of all of those notes. And you can go through, if you want to, every single session and look at all of the notes. They're completely public. So I encourage you, encourage you to check that out. Um, there are a, a sort of caveat is that it was on a volunteer basis. So some of the sessions have, you know, better notes or, or not as good notes. But um, check out the, those notes, Google Docs, and see those. Also, we put together a Twitter list. So twitter.com slash tendency slash N10 hyphen NTC. And that is a public list that we put together of some of the people who are were involved in NTC or spoke or just some interesting people that we met while we were there. Um, it is by no means a comprehensive list of everyone. We sort of did our best to, to get the people that if you're interested in following along, if you're interested in, you know, keeping up with kind of what's going on in nonprofit technology, these are some, it's some people that you want to keep an eye on. If you notice there's somebody that we left out, feel free free to tweet us at Tendency and let us know. We're happy to add them. Um, like I said, this was kind of our, our first pass at the list. So, And now I'm going to kick it over to Sarah to talk about some of the trends that we saw. Thanks, Caitlin. Can everyone hear me OK? I'm going to assume yes, unless someone starts putting things in the chat, since I know you guys are all muted. So I'm Sarah Worthy. You've heard a little bit about me. We're going to go on to talk about trends. And uh, so I noticed that these four nonprofit technology tactical type trends, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, the data at Intech 
was incredible and it's showing that this type of marketing for fundraising really works by making these things personal and more than just your donation form now you've got your friends sharing and we go into some of that in our own session so you'll hear more about that in a little while mobile and tablet Everyone knows mobile is a trend. Um, I just thought it was really surprising to hear some of the ways that people are using mobile, especially in ways because the device isn't, just because someone's visiting your site from a mobile device, it doesn't mean that they are actually on the go at the time. So interesting. Um, User-centric design or donor-centric design with technology in your website. Technology has now made our jobs both so much harder and also so much easier for creating these personalized experiences. And so there were a lot of conversations going on at the session about how you can create real custom experiences to show value for your members and donors and drive that engagement. And then big data and social serum, nonprofits now have access to all of these new tools that we can use to collect and analyze our conversations across the social networks and start tying them into our organization's overall impact. And that was a pretty cool thing for me. Um, a really big overall topic that I felt intent is doing so much for and this bitly goes to an integrated marketing webinar series for members of intent.org is free and they have recordings of the webinars in case you missed it on demand so definitely check that out to learn all about integrated marketing and everyone is probably doing integrated marketing you just don't realize it uh, you're identifying these new ways to share your cause and value propositions by having conversations with your community and these conversations will typically start in one place like at an event or on social media and they carry over to these other communication portals so I thought uh, integrated marketing is definitely a really important um, full set of tools. I think it's hard to put it in one word um, but technology now gives us these better ways for following and measuring the conversations and it was really cool to hear how some of the nonprofits are doing integrated marketing um, and uh, the, the coolest trend for me that really uh, struck a chord for me was the idea that uh, around changing your perspective and considering things like the problem isn't your budget, it's your frame. The advice that a lot of leaders at InTech, and I'll share a couple of these um, summaries from sessions, is that you want to escape that zero-sum scarcity model. It's going to hurt your movements and your organizations and instead use abundance as your frame. Your budget, your staff, they aren't the only resources you have. You have as many resources as you can hold on to in your brain to do the work you need to do thanks to the internet. That right there is a quote from Rachel Whitinger in one of her sessions and it just really, um, that just woke me up on how you can improve online fundraising. And then Caitlin, the thing that rocked her world on the trends, I like to have, of course, is the data and the analytics. <laughs> and Sarah, just fair warning, I've got my presentation on full screen, so I can't see the chat box anymore. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm leave that to it. you. <laughs> I have three screens open. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so as Sarah mentioned, this was one of the sessions that are one of the trends that I that really struck me. Of course, it's I'm I'm kind of a, a data geek, so I, I enjoy this kind of thing. <laughs> um, this was a re, uh, this was a session given by Blackbot on their charitable giving report, and they do this report at the end of every year and kind of look at trends in online giving. And so these were the big trends that they saw this year. And um, the first one is that online giving returned to double digit growth in 2012. In 20 in going back to 2010, so going back to you know a few years ago, online giving was way way up, like something crazy, like 34% up, like crazy numbers in 2010. So then in 2011, the numbers were fairly flat as far as the, you know, the percentage of donations that come in through online and the dollars and all of that. From 2010 to 2011, it was fairly flat. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's more about how 2010 was so far up that then when we got to 2011, it was pretty flat. In 2012, we saw what um, this session was put on by uh, Steve McLaughlin of BlackBot. And he said that, you know, kind of what they would consider normal, that we're back to, you know, 11% growth in 2012. And that is more of where we expect to see it stabilize kind of in the future. So online donations are on the charitable giving online is growing overall 11%. Um, they did, if you go download this report and here's the link, they break it down by small, medium, large organizations. They break it down by sector. So like what do educational nonprofits, you know, 
what does their activity look like online versus like an arts organization versus like philanthropy organizations. You can really dig into that data. Um, the overall trend is that online giving is up overall in every single sector, at least somewhat. And um, the second trend is that online giving is extremely predictable. And these are just some numbers that sort of blew my mind a little bit. The top set is first year retention. So for a donor that gives only offline, uh, the next year you, they can expect to be, you can expect to retain about 29% of them. If the donor only gives online, you can retain about 23% of them. But if a donor gives in two different places, and this is sort of what Sarah was talking about, about the power of this multi-channel um, outreach, if they give in in two places, in both online and offline, they you can retain them at 58%. So it's sort of like, it's you know greater than the sum of its parts. If you can get somebody who is interacting offline and online, that the retention is just so much higher. Um, also that smaller organizations receive a larger percentage of donations online and sort of um, what the, the theory behind this that um, the guys at BlackBot think is happening is because on getting online donations tends to be a, a less expensive way to get donations, that smaller organizations are relying on those methods a little more, and that that's probably why that number is higher. Um, you'll see that the numbers are not crazy, crazy different from small, medium to large, but small organizations, a little bit over 8% of their uh, their fundraising comes from online, medium 6%, and large 7.5%. And just to give you an idea, a small they categorize small as under 1 million, mediums 1 to 10 million, and large is greater than $10 million. Oh, some other notes as far as um, online donations being really predictable. Um, they were talking about how December is the highest month for donations. If you've seen these kind of stats before, you've probably seen that number that December is, is just a, a spike when you see a spike in online donations. Um, but they also talked about things like in the education sector, there's actually another spike in June. And that tends to be because education uh, nonprofits, their fiscal year sort of starts and ends you know, in the summertime. And so that's why education nonprofits have that spike in June. And um, he also talked about how things like the day of the week doesn't really matter too much. Um, there are more online donations on during the week, like weekdays, Monday through Friday, and then a, a fewer on the weekends. But other than that, there's no day like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's really any better than any other weekday. So I thought that was really interesting. The third trend in this charitable giving report is that everything is mobile. And it was interesting because one of the big things they talked about was that everything is mobile, but not always in the way that you think, like really that email is driving mobile giving. And then that's something it's sort of not quite as sexy as like responsive design or some of the other mobile trends we're seeing, but email, 90% of people open email on their computer and their phone. And I, I've read some other study that like 30% of people wake up and before they even like get out of bed, they first thing they do is pick up their phone and look at their email. And I'm definitely like that with, you know, squinting with one eye open trying to read your email in the morning. So email is just so prevalent in our world that that when you're thinking about online giving, think about email. And the two big takeaways kind of tips were if you're sending an email with a link to a donation form, make sure that that form looks good on a phone. Even if you, you know, if you have to pick between the mobile version of it and the desktop version, send them to the mobile version because, you know, a desktop user will understand, but a mobile user, if they can't, you know, you want them to be able to, to donate. Also, he talked about a good place to start with mobile is maybe you don't have the budget to make your whole site mobile, but think about the action pages. So if someone needs to donate or register for an event or, you know, whatever those or fill out a contact form or whatever your kind of action pages are, start with those and make sure that those really function and work and, and look good and, and are easy to use on a mobile device. So if anybody has any questions, like we, we've been saying, type in the chat box. We've muted everybody except us. So, um, so type away if you have questions. The next section we're going to go into is recapping our presentation. So we, um, you'll see this picture is, is a phone picture. We haven't processed all of the, we're so recent, newly back that we haven't even processed all, the, all the, the fancy photos. But this is a phone camera photo of our session. You'll see Sarah and me and Aaron. Um, there in the shot. So our presentation was on leveling up your online fundraising. And we really talked about, so we work with a lot of nonprofit clients and nonprofit websites, and we really try to incorporate 
web marketing fundamentals and psychology into making our websites more valuable. So what we talked about was sort of how to how to translate that specifically to online donations. And then shout out to Aaron Long, who is our VP of Client Services, who was with us in the original presentation. I'm going to recap it pretty quickly for you guys today. Uh, but those, this is our this is our original opening slide. Also, this morning, we actually published a recap of this presentation. So I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but we posted, you know, in more detail with resources and things like that on blog.tendency.com. So, so check that out. Okay. So online giving is on the rise. I, I've mentioned that it's been growing um, over time. We have about 10 years of data on this, and it continues to grow. Um, according to the 2012 Digital Giving Index, 65% of people gave online in 2012, where back in 2002, only about 4% of donors donated online. Uh, the average donation through social media is increasing. Uh, we found in the same study, they show that organizations that incorporated social media into their giving campaigns actually raised 10 times more funds. So online fundraising is extremely, you know, it's growing. It's, it's a big opportunity. And just a caveat, when we talk about fundraising, we don't just mean your online donation form. We mean things like your job board and on, uh, sponsorships and event registration and in-kind gifts and sort of all of those things that are, that are revenue, that are helped by your website, they're helped by things that are going on online. So why do people give? There are three motivations of people, and this is based on an article by our CEO, Ed Schippel, that is, again, linked in the blog post. Go to blog.tendency.com to, to read up more specifics on these. But there are three main motivations of why people really do anything, and that is social, material, and ideological. And the idea behind social is that they want to feel a sense of belonging, or they want it's because of a relationship or because of some kind of identity um, that's social. Material is actually the most straightforward, even though it's a little bit, um, you know, we try, tend not to think about material when we think about nonprofits, but really it's it's essentially someone does something and they get some kind of financial gain in, in the process, whether that's a discount or um, this is an example of the National Association of Disability Representatives and their mem they're a nonprofit and they have a, their membership organization and they provide their members with continuing education credits and things that um, it, it's the, sense, the main primary reason why people join the organization is so that they have access to these material things. Uh, the third motivation of people is ideological, which ideological tends to be where we we think with nonprofits we would like to start there. But a lot of times, and we're going to go into some more examples, but a lot of times people will come and interact with you for the first time based on a social or a material motivation. And then hopefully you can sort of foster that relationship and build them to where they're, they're donating, they're participating for, you know, just for ideological reasons. So we talked about the motivations of people. And we're talking about online, you have some challenges. Uh, people are, you have about seven seconds for people to make a brand impression about you online. So you're in a super tight window. You have to tap into all three of those motiv you know, tap into those motivations in this really short window. Uh, the other thing that we found is that visitors of nonprofit websites are skeptical. And this is a study from Stanford University. And what they did was they, they, they studied all these people and they asked them, what or they tried to figure out what how they evaluated credibility online and so they figured out all these different factors and you know different people weigh things differently and um, then they they graph that out based on the type of website so the graph you're looking at on the left is design so this graph shows that uh, the red line is all sites so on average 46 percent of people say that they evaluate a website based on its design. Well, for nonprofits, you can see that little blue arrow, it's down, it's only 39% of people said that they evaluated a nonprofit website credibility on design. So for nonprofits, design is important. 39% is still a lot, it's still the highest, the, you know, the most heavily ranked factor, but in compared to all sites, non for nonprofits, design is actually uh, slightly less important. And if you contrast that to the right side, on the right side, you'll see comments related to company motive. So for all sites, about 15% of people said that they 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 rated cred credibility based on the company motive. For nonprofits, you'll see that number is higher. That number is up at 20%, only just below finance, just below opinion. People really do, when they're 
they care more about the company motive than for the average website because they're essentially going into it skeptical of what that motive is for nonprofits. So you have seven seconds to tap into motivations. Your, your visitors are extremely skeptical. You know, people are, they're very impatient on, on the web. So what can you do about that? There is good news. Uh, content is a way that you can build credibility online. And there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, these are some questions that we sort of posed. Who benefits from their donation? How you're going to use this donation? Who are the people, you know, who is your staff? Instead of just having a list on your website, can you have photos of the real staff or, you know, like little bio, even a sentence about each person? So to really build credibility and show that there are real people behind your organization and that you are, um, your, the, that company motive is there. These examples are also extremely visual. It, anytime you can incorporate visuals into the web, that's going to again show that credibility, show that you're show that you're real. You know, you can tell right away that photo on the left that those are real kids at camp. You know, that's not a stock photo; those are real kids. Also, visuals. Your brain processes visuals much faster than text. So, if you think about the average person reads 200 to 300 words per minute. That means that they get through a sentence in a couple of seconds. You know, if you have a couple of paragraphs of text, you you might hit your seven second limit before they've read all of that. But with a photo, your brain can process that information in one twentieth of a second. So you're, you know, when you're talking about using psychology and tapping into the brain, photos are a much more efficient way to do that. So these are the seven tactics that we talked about in our presentation. I'm going to roll through them pretty quickly. And again, go to blog.tennessee.com for more details. I know I've said that a couple of times, but um, I, we, we, I'm going to try to touch on all of these. And then if you, if you need want more information, that's a, a great place to look. So the first tactic is framing the ask. And this is less about making your, you know, making your donate button look pretty and more about making it, keeping it consistent with all of your other properties. This is the YMCA of Houston. Uh, they're a longtime client. They're wonderful to work with. They recently went through a rebranding for all of the Ys and they have, they do a really great job of keeping their brand consistent. Their website is actually made up of, they use Tendency, they use Drupal, they use Class, they use a lot of different properties, but throughout all of them, it looks like the Y, it uses the same branding, you're building trust with that, you know, you're seeing something familiar and, and keeping that trust. Uh, the second tactic is creating trust with donors. So there are, um, we talked about some content that you can use to build credibility. And these are a couple of specific examples. The one on the top left is Bark Houston, who is a client that they are essentially the, um, um, the, with the city of Houston, the animal shelter with the city of Houston, and they use video to talk about their people, to talk about their volunteers. Um, they actually, uh, they this is a real volunteer. This is Kindle. And uh, again, we didn't, in the interest of time, we're not going to show the video, but it, it is linked um, out in that blog post. Check out, they have really great videos about their staff and about all the great things they do. Um, on the right, you've got third-party validations. That's DePelton's Children's Center. And um, on the bottom, you've got how do you use donations, which this is Susan G. Komen of Houston talking specifically about where your donations go, what they do with the donations, what sort of change that they've caused with these donations. So anytime you can think about what content you can create trust with your donors, talk about what, um, you know, sort of hand it to them, give, make it easy for them to find this content and make it easy for them to, to see and to understand it and to uh, build, build trust online. So the third tactic is applying social pressure. Uh, this is an example of iFest, which is the Houston International Festival. Again, a, a longtime client that we've worked with. They do a great job of, they host events. So this is a kickoff event that happened um, at the end of last month. And they invited people who were volunteers or who were on the board or, you know, they we have a relationship with them. So they invited, that's our, our team sitting at the table over there on the left, knowing full well that we would talk about the event. We would take photos. We would take Instagram photos. We posted the, you see the pictures of the Brazilian dancers in the middle there and that these photos would, we'd share them all over social media and people would see that, oh, look, this is a really cool event. And then, oh, the festival is coming up. The festival is actually next weekend and the weekend after. So if you're in Houston, a quick plug for iFest, um, they do, they choose a country every year for their theme. This year is Brazil. And you can see all the kind of fun things that you can expect at the festival based on us sharing these um, 
these kind of social items online based on this event. So the fourth tactic is giving back first. And there are a couple of different ways you can give back first. The, the idea behind this is that uh, when you when someone is new to your cause, you have to think about it a little bit like dating. If someone is new to your cause, there you have to give them a little more in the beginning. You know, you have to work a little harder when you first meet someone. So w ways that you can do that is give back to people kind of before you ever ask for a donation. And there are ways to do this. Uh, one of the examples that we use that I'm, that is not listed here is the Children's Museum of Houston does a Groupon every year, and they do two for one museum admission, and they sell out their Groupons every single time. They get tons of great traffic and uh, from it. But some of the ways that you can do that, say you don't necessarily have tickets to a museum or you don't have the sort of physical material things to give, um, are examples like this one. This is Beaumont ISD. This graph down here at the bottom shows pages that people visit after the homepage. So 19% of people after going to the homepage, they click on this little tiny link that I've showed in red up in the middle. And that is essentially this, it's a parent self-service portal that people come from to homepage, they dig through and they look for this little link and 19% of people click on it. So things like watching your analytics and looking for what content people care about, looking for what they want and giving it to them. That is a way to give back first. Speaking of content, also things like curating content, becoming a resource for your cause anytime you can. We have a couple of clients who have really fantastic resource libraries where they are curating content and um, they're sort of doing the work. They're putting in the time and saying, these are really good resources if you're interested in our cause. And then if somebody comes to their site, they see that they are it not only shows that they're kind of an authority on the subject, but it's that way of giving back. And they're saying, okay, we've done this hard work. We've put this together. And now hopefully their, their potential donors, their potential volunteers can, can get the benefit of finding all that information in one place. Uh, the fifth tactic, we're almost through. We've got seven tactics. We're on number five is aim for slow change. So the idea behind this is that in we talk about the three motivations of people, social, material, and ideological. The first impression with you may not be an ideological one. This is PRSA of Houston. They have a fantastic job board and 60% of their page views actually come in to their job board. So a lot of times the first time someone's hearing about them is through their job board. So think about, figure out what those kind of Barrier to entries are barriers to entry are for you. Where are people coming in? It may be, um, you know, it may be like for the zoo. I know they have a young professionals organization, and oftentimes the young professionals are coming in to. They may come to a happy hour, not necessarily because they are ideologically motivated to come to that happy hour and support the zoo, but maybe just because their friends are there and they want to drink beer with their friends at the zoo, you know? So think about what is that sort of barrier to entry? What is that first starting? What is that first touch point for you? And how can you make the most of it? So for PRSA, they do things like they have these big call outs that say, you know, here's our student directory, here's our business directory. And they try to take advantage of, well, did you know that if you become a member, you can post a job for you know, you get a discounted rate. So think about what what is that first touch point and how can you take advantage of it? And the sixth tactic is inbound marketing. And inbound marketing is essentially using content marketing to bring traffic to your site through things like search engines and social media. So you're putting content out there that will bring people in to you. Uh, there's a, a benchmark that we, we use internally where we recommend to clients that they have about 60 to 75% of their traffic come from organic Google search. And this is essentially because if somebody comes to your site because they typed it in or because they clicked a link from somewhere else, that means that they either know about you already or they have some idea of who you are. They have someone else's vouch for you and they clicked on that link. But if they come in through organic Google search, those are probably new people who may or may not have heard about you. They may be searching for something around your cause. You know, if you're the YMCA, they may be searching for activities for kids to do after school. You know, they're they're coming to you. They're new. And so you really want to take advantage of the those potential um new new people. Um, inbound marketing is particularly important because the, it's based on the idea that in traditional marketing, things are pushed out to people. So if you're sitting watching TV, advertising is pushed to you. Or if you're reading the newspaper, paid advertising is pushed to you. But with inbound, it takes advantage of 
people who are going to Google and searching things, you know, they're not, they're not, they, they're, they're searching for information and people who are searching for things, um, they are, if you're sort of in the right place at the right time, they are interested in, in looking, you know, you want to create content that's interesting for them to look at uh, when they're doing searches. This example is volunteer in Houston and you'll see it's a Google search. You'll see on the right, some text, you'll see some video, um, results. You'll see some image results. You'll see some news results. Those are, it sort of, you know, when they're when they're searching there, when they're ready to find that content, that you're the one that they find. So the seventh tactic is recognizing your value and charging for it. Uh, we have a lot of clients that are membership organizations, and they, uh, you know, we try to think about ways that you can recognize your value and and charge for, you know increase your revenue based on the value you provide. So memberships are a great way to do this. Uh, for instance, member hosting member only events or um, this screenshot on the right is the National Pharmacy Technician Association, NPTA.org. And they not only provide member benefits, but they actually sort of lobby on behalf of the pharmacy technicians and they've passed, like this is an example, Emily's Law signed by the governor based on um, a, you know, pharmacy technicians. This is based on a little girl named Emily who unfortunately died because a pharmacy technician gave her the wrong medication. So the pharmacy technicians kind of got together and said, we need to impose, you know, we need to figure out these stricter kind of regulations on our industry. And they, because of NPT, the work that NPTA did kind of on behalf of all of the pharmacy technicians, they were able to pass this law. So that's an added value that is not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily an exclusive event or, or, you know, anything that um, where you're giving them anything material that is that is uh, NPTA lobbying on behalf of this larger organization. So those are our seven tactics. And again, go to blog.tendency.com if you want to read more. I blew them through them pretty quickly. And we're going to start by talking about some other panels that we loved. And I'm, it's still me. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep rolling. Um, so this is a panel that I went to that is NPO event marketing. It was from, it's called The Party's Over, How to Create Lo Loyal Donors and Lasting Value from Big Events. This was put on by the, um, by Bethany Bauman from Merkel and Johanna, I think her last name's Olivas from uh, the United States Olympic Committee. And they essentially talked about how they have this challenge with the U.S. The USOC is a 501c3. They they rely on donations for their funding, which is, first of all, something that not a lot of people, I didn't know that. I'm a big Olympics fan, and I didn't know that. Um, they also run into issues with, they have this huge event every two years, and then after that event's over, there's this sort of two-year slump where they want to keep the momentum going and keep everyone engaged and keep those donations coming in. And so, they talked about some challenges with that. They sort of broke it down into pre, you know, before the event, during the event, and after the event. And I, I know I pulled out some of the um, biggest takeaways. The biggest thing was before the event, they talked about how they segmented their list. So they actually had a huge email list and they broke it into people who they thought would only respond to what they call premium offers. So people that would only respond to like donate this much money and we'll give you a free uh, Team USA jacket or something like that. So they, they segmented those people out and they kept continuing to give them premium offers because that's what they had that's what they had responded to in the past. And then for the second group, they mixed in these premium offers with things like, you know, kind of our ideological calls or stories about the athletes. And they, they tested those two different groups. So they set that up all ahead of time. They also, they sort of figured out the right appeal to content ratio for them where people would, um, you know, not unsubscribe because they were giving them enough cool content with the appeals. And what they kind of figured out was that the, they used three to one. So for three, every three pieces of content, they would do one, um, you know, donation appeal. So uh, the fourth, every fourth email would be an appeal. And they also made some decisions ahead of time about what content goes on which channel. So for the Olympic, for the London Olympics specifically, they decided ahead of time that Twitter would be for breaking news and Facebook would be for supporting Team USA. So they made those decisions ahead of time and then they knew if there was a breaking news story or if they had, you know, a graphic that they made to support Team USA, they knew exactly where to put it because they, you know, made those decisions ahead of time. Also, after the event, 
thank yous are so important. Uh, another really interesting thing they talked about was that they there's always a post party slump and that they found, you know, they had done all of this work leading up to the Olympics and everyone was so excited and they were literally sending daily emails that they would get these really high click through rates on, you know, their audience was super engaged and then after the Olympics were over, they tried to send a donation request out in the Olympics are over in July you know, the end of July, they sent a request out in like September and got the lowest click through rates that they had like ever seen. And so they said, or the advice, the takeaway was expect there to be this slump where if you have these huge events after the event, you know, sort of immediately after the event, people are going to be a little tired of hearing from you and give them a little bit of breathing room. And you're just going to have to, for you know, trial and error, figure out what that slump is for you, how long until you start seeing traction again. So the next panel that we went to that uh, we absolutely loved was the Ideal Wear Measuring Your Mission panel. And this was put on by Laura Quinn, who's the executive director of Ideal Wear. Ideal Wear is a really fantastic sort of neutral third party association. You know, they don't they don't really like they're not pitching a product or anything. They're just putting out reports for nonprofits. They do a really fantastic job there with including information and reporting. This is a framework for measurement that Laura talked about that is based on, you'll see a link down there to her blog post that kind of talks about this. And, and I've given you the bullets. Essentially, it talks about if you're measuring your mission, there are a lot of different ways to measure what you're doing. And you should think of it sort of like a pyramid. And this is our pyramid. And start at the bottom and start at this like foundational elements and work your way up. So the bottom is start by measuring your own activity. What are you doing? And she put some, put some examples in here like how many classes are you conducting? How many emails have you sent? How many, you know, those, what are you, start with what you're doing. And then the next step is measuring participation. So who went to your classes and who downloaded your reports and who signed your pledge? Uh, the next step is initial kind of satisfaction or success. So this, it gets a little, instead of just what we're doing, now you're, you're reaching out and you're doing things like surveys and saying, what, well, how was this event for you? Or how was this class? Or how much did you learn? Or, you know, that kind of thing. And that those three down at the bottom that are in kind of dark blue are, um, tend to be that something that, that most everyone can do. And then the next two are a little bit harder. And um, the next one is long-term satisfaction or activity. So the example she used was, say you, you know, you put on a training class and then you, um, you survey those people and then you survey them a year later and say, well, did this class still, was it still impactful? Are you still experiencing improvement? And that's a little bit harder to do because of the timeline, but it, it's, um, it's, it's just really important to see that are your, what you're doing having long-term effects. And then the last one at the top there, attributable impact, is what she described as the holy grail, which is often tends to be things like large-scale university research of what are the effects of what you're doing on the community as a whole. You know, how much are you, um, how much are you moving the needle on, on your, like, your cause? It, in your community. And that's a little bit harder to do. But if you try to, a lot of times when you talk about measuring your mission, nonprofits will sort of think that they're going to start there and that that's so much harder to do. So start with what you can control, start with what you can gather, start at the bottom of this pyramid and then work your way up. I've got a couple of measurement resources and we're going to post the slides so I won't go through all of these, but these are some ideal where resources that Laura shared that was, um, you know, good places to start with, with measurement. And now I'm going to kick it over to Sarah. Hi, I'm back. Um, so if you guys haven't had a chance to watch Dan Pelota's uh, TEDx uh, video, it is awesome. And we link to all of this again from other sites and the pages and also the transcripts for his presentation. But he was the keynote on, I believe, Friday at Intech. They had a different keynote speaker every day. And his TED talk, the video, is like a Reader's Digest version of what he wants to talk about this morning is um, how he starts the presentation. So it's a great opportunity to watch that. Uh, and he, so Dan encourages people to change their frame. Again, that change the frame trend I love. And think of philanthropy as the marketplace for love. And it's where passionate people are producing value by caring about and helping improve the world. And if we think about this, that we're thinking about charity wrong, and when we reevaluate how nonprofits use their donations, we should be incentivizing nonprofits so that they're being rewarded more based on the value they're producing and 
instead of on how much money they aren't spending from their donations. And his example is really good. If you want to sell violent video games to our school children here and earn $50 million as a for-profit, it, it's great. Everyone says great. Uh, however, you become a parasite, so to speak, if you want to make half a million dollars curing ma malaria as a nonprofit. It, it's, you know, quite an imbalance. And he says that the way to solve this is to address these five discriminatory economic factors. Um, he talks about compensation, and that's the salary that nonprofit executive directors and staff need to be paid um, comparable to what they would be making in the for-profit world, because when people graduate college, they would prefer to go get paid, right? <laughs> it keeps people from who are quality talent from entering the nonprofit world. Um, advertising and marketing, a lot of nonprofits aren't supposed to spend those donations on advertising and marketing versus in the for-profit world. You're supposed to spend every marketing dollar you can as long as you are getting more back in value than you're spending. Um, so it's just a different mindset. The idea that number three, taking the risk of pursuing new ideas for generating revenue, this uh, discriminatory factor really feels like something I understand best through my work with the startup nonprofits because they actually, are, you know, startups are running them and they're like, yes, let's try the newest thing. Let's try it. And so they actually have a little bit of the opposite idea of uh, needing to old school it and, you know, you do need to send out postcards sometimes too and mail outs and, and that, you know, slow it down because they can take too much risk. However, most nonprofits don't get that advantage. And so they aren't able to take the risk of trying a new innovative um, thing that might help their cause. For example, a cancer cure. But it costs $5 million to start up the research. And the board's like, that's your entire budget. We're not letting you spend it on this. Even though once they, you know, finish that study, they could now have a $10, $15 million budget. I'm randomly throwing out numbers as the example. Um, time. Nonprofits typically are looking at something on an annual or even monthly schedule. You know, this month, this Christmas donations are big gala in the summer. And, you know, they need to change that perspective to look at the long term. What can we be doing this year? Because it's a long, slow process. So that five years, 10 years, 20 years, we're still on the same track and growing. And the last one's profit. I think everyone sees the obvious one here. Nonprofits tend to stick with the frame that that means they're not supposed to make a profit. And it's actually the opposite. So that was definitely an awesome mind-changing session. And then I have to ask you to change this. I'm, I, I don't mind if everyone hears this. This is what happened. So Ivan's last name is Booth, and he's at Root Work on Twitter. And my brain was mistake. So I'm going to have Caitlin in live change it really fast because it's important. But, I, you know, we did just get back. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I need to make sure this is right. So this session was actually the first session at Intech, and believe it or not, as great as all the other sessions were, I think I gained so much value from this one out of all of them. Um, it was about building movements that, and their point was that it, this involves causing change inside a larger ecosystem than just your single organization. And so Ivan talked about um, the different key ways that nonprofits need to change their frame. Sorry, we're holding up here. And it's the time delay in webinars. Um, Ivan it talks about the key ways that nonprofits can change their frame to build movements. And I have put some of his key bullet points up here. And as I go through this, it, I want you to think about situating your group as part of something bigger. You're not just the local Red Cross or YMCA. You are part of you know, an international one. And there's regional groups as examples. And uh, you also, you know, if you're worried about promoting competitors, well, promote people at a distance and that are in other countries, other states, people who are related to your larger movement. Um, you know, if you're doing the blood donations, then maybe you want to work with someone who is doing transfusions for plasma because they're kind of the same. And I don't know. <laughs> um, but you also want to give up a little of your message control and instead of trying to control that message, think about how taking this action will get you closer to your movement goals and because you will grow it much more if you allow your donors, your supporters to engage with you. And once people have connected with these ties and the networks that you're building, they'll be more committed to your cause. 
And so then Rachel went into this amazing study that she has done with her work at Upwell, a nonprofit that says their client is the ocean. And they talk about ocean related issues. Um, so she wanted to do this study to measure conversations on social media and see how you could build and increase this and use it to build your movements. So um, I'm going to kind of go through some of these. This first one is basically she says that all of those conversations that are going on within your movement are part of a larger conversation, which is everyone on social media and on the news. And so what's trending one day, you know, gun control might not be what your cause is about, and it might be so popular. I mean, you know, there's news right now that there's always some story that's, you know, tragedy. And but so how do you face this big ocean of conversations as a nonprofit with limited staff and time and measure those shares, mentions, and replies to see what the collective is talking about right now? And if today might be the day you want to go out and talk about your cause and how to make that change, or maybe you want to push it off to another day because no one's really paying attention. And so she set about to measure this and the first thing she did was establish a baseline. This is her process. All of this is linked and it's literally 600 pages. Um, so it's a great report if you all want to read it. And she made this map of the different key influencers and people that are in the ocean movement. She did keyword research and then kind of hacked together a dashboard using Radian 6 and some other tools. I believe in another session when she was just getting started, she was saying Yahoo Pipes was another tool she also mentioned. Um, and then after she established the baseline, and this goes really right into what Caitlin was talking about with the ideal where too, with a, a case study, sort of how you apply that um, steps, because uh, she established the baseline, and then her goal was to see if she could move the baseline, and she had these ideas about how to do it. And I'm not going to go into full detail again, but the way she decided to do this was Discovery Channel has been publishing their data about the social conversations around their annual Shark Week event for a few years. And she was seeing that it was showing dramatic increases from 2010 to 2011 in the conversations around Shark Week and the hashtag Shark Week. So she put together what she called a Sharkinar. She invited the key influencers who had interests in the ocean, like scuba divers, surfers, marine biologists, whale and dolphin people, and she told them all in this webinar, Shark Week's going to be really big, and you all should be talking about your causes and get in on this Shark Week hashtag, because people are going to be paying more attention than usual to the issue, and you could ride this wave in this ocean of social conversations. And her test worked. When you look at the chart on the right, the fluffy, the um, quilt section under 2012 shows the effect that the influencers in Rachel's selected group had on increasing the conversation in 2012 around Shark Week and Discovery Channel is the full bar so she had a percentage of the full bar of the Shark Week and I think this is really cool. I'm still not wrapping my mind around it. Um, and then so the final session that I went to was the community organizer session, and as the uh, Elijah is the Net Square community organizer at the international level and was the leader of this group, he called it group therapy for people who organize events. I'm guessing there's quite a few people on this call who understand what that kind of feels like and the need for it. Um, and so, what's a community organizer? In case you aren't one of those, uh, well, community organizers are, uh, in my definition. Personally, passionate problem solvers, we find it very rewarding to connect people to the things we love and help ignite this passion in others around their own interests. And nonprofits are, by their nature, community organizers because you're working to organize these people who are passionate about your cause and you want to get them to contribute. So keep in mind, you know, one of the big takeaways from this overall session was um, nonprofits need to understand how to organize their community. You, these are things you need to learn, particularly working with leaders and influences in your in influencers in your community. Focus on who those are and how you get that message across to them so they can be involved. And then when you're thinking about proximity to think about proximity to your cause, how much does someone else's passion around the cause match yours rather than just physical location? And that'll help bring in that integrated marketing approach. Um, so 
I'm a community organizer for several nonprofits, as well as my role here. <laughs> and, and so the session also gave me some really practical and actionable tips on how I could utilize online offline events to grow my communities. And the session started where we all came together in a circle and as we introduced ourselves, we shared why we were passionate about community organization and also our biggest challenges or problems that we need to solve. And I posted some of those big challenges or problems that are typical so you can kind of see that it, you know, do you guys have these same questions and problems or have you solved them because people want those answers. Um, and then from those takeaways, my circle when we broke up picked one of the questions that was, you know, among the, what didn't work and we picked how do we get people to show up, which is addressing the problems about both increasing overall registrations at an event as well as getting people who have RSVP'd to actually show up at the event. And so here's the top like takeaways that I'm going to and have already started implementing if you're on my NetSquared mailing list. Instead of using Facebook events where everyone just RSVPs yes, but then none of them ever show up, use your website, calendar, or a tool like Eventbrite for the registrations and then post the link and the details to a Facebook group or your brand page and have them come back and register on your site. Um, the personal phone calls and emails that you need to make to get people to come out, those actually do really make a difference to remind people. Um, but as a community organizer, I never have time for that. And so one of the great suggestions was take your list of the registrants and ask your core members, they're the people who never miss the lunch, ask them to make those personal reach outs for you. And then it's worth taking a day or two out of your year for you know maybe small events or monthly events or a week or longer for these big conferences to just plan out your topics, update your calendars, list the events and create those promotional timelines so that you're prepared and your community knows what's going on. Um, oh and then this was not the last session but a very helpful session for all of our clients and people who want to know about websites was the Idealware CMS review. Laura Quinn and Kyle Andre, who work at Idealware, they have a they walked through the CMS report for 2012 and you can download the report for free from that link up there. And no tenancy isn't in it because you have to fill out a survey and request it. We'll be sending that out later this year to all of our clients and newsletter subscribers if you want to vote for tenancy. All you have to do is recommend that it be included and they just need to get a certain number. Um, but that's enough of a plug because <laughs> we want to we want to see how we compare like officially. Um, so what does a CMS do? It, you know, she de Laura describes it as it's a database is basically it backed by HTML templates and a design and style sheet. So everything's managed and you can quickly add new pages without having to hand code or redesign the entire thing. And it helps organize your content better. So. Uh, but as a very rough overview. And then her session also talked about how do you go about choosing a CMS? Um, do you choose the system first? Do you choose a consultant? Most nonprofits have a preferred vendor who helps them with their website development, design, and marketing. Uh, she talked about the seven factors that you should consider uh, in order to evaluate your website. And then she said that cost is obviously important, but it shouldn't be one of the decision-making factors in choosing it. And she, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, her final point was to remember the human side of the equation, that the CMS is an element of your website and a high quality design and great content is more important than a feature rich platform. And when she talked about costs in the session, uh, Laura stressed that it's a mistake to make this decision, uh, make the decision for which CMS entirely based on cost. And she gives this demonstration where these numbers on this chart are completely wrong. It's probably kind of small. So, and she apologized too because I couldn't find her original presentation to take this from, but she had said the colors weren't supposed to look like that either. Uh, but when you're evaluating, you don't want to look at just open source or just vendor specific. And implementation costs can vary wildly. So you really don't know what it's going to cost. So the numbers on this chart that she uses in her example are made up to show the example of how you might have no license cost if something is open source versus proprietary, you'll have a $5,000 upfront fee just to pay for the license. And then ongoing, you may 
or, I mean, and then once implementation comes up, the open source might cost you a little more because you're going to have to find a vendor and it's going to take a little time to set up integrations and plugins and things like that versus going with a proprietary solution so that your total for those upfront costs ends up being exactly the same. And these are, you know, sometimes open source and vendor are reverse. It all of a sudden made up numbers. It's just to kind of show this totally does happen where it can cost the same to go with either of those solutions. And what I also want to stress that she said in this panel is that there's going to be ongoing costs. There's going to be ongoing license fees if you are using a proprietary solution. There's going to be ongoing support costs. They're going to be, you know, are, are you doing the copywriting? Are you doing, you know, the hosting? Someone's paying for that either internally or externally. As that's 24-7 as long as you want your website to be online. So when you're making your budgets for a CMS, keep in mind um, it's not just that first quote. It goes every month usually. And then um, the cool tech toys on the show room floor and everything. Caitlin and I are both going to do that. Um, I just talked a little bit about the CMS and one of the big takeaways for me personally from this conference was I gained a much more solid understanding of the difference between a CMS and a CRM. And a CRM is a constituent relationship management or content, I mean customer relationship management uh, platform. And the importance of having both of those when you're managing your online fundraising programs is actually key. And I'm going to try to explain it really simply. The CMS will enable you to communicate with your community and more complex websites off, or their plugins will offer ways for your community to talk back to you through your website so you can collaborate and start creating this conversation across your organization's content. And a CMS has ways to track this type of traffic through Google Analytics, for example, but your website is just one part of your overall fundraising program. And that's where the relationship management platform comes in and plays a role in this. And the CRM is taking the data from your website and from your offline fundraising efforts, from your email marketing campaigns, and all of these different ways that you're interacting with your constituents. And it's keeping it in one place to provide this dashboard reporting so you can see the relationships much more clearly. So as an example, you might have a strong active supporter who pays at events and maybe they donated through an email app and they've given to a couple of the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, donation pages that you have. They also donate on your website and they joined your national organization and become a member of yours. The website's only going to know about that one donation on the website, not about you know, all of the other ways that they've gotten involved offline and away from your site. So a CRM integrated with your website is a real benefit. Um, and like we saw a couple of Zarista, the My In Tech conference app is a really great example of a social type of CRM for event conferences. And then I think Caitlin's going to talk about the other ones coming up, right? So I'll just talk about Facebook Power Editor. This is a Chrome plugin and it's really free and if you're doing anything with Facebook advertising then this is something that oh, several people recommend including the people at socialfresh.com who also have a post that talks about all the different ways you can use it. But it's basically an advanced editor that lets you manage a large number of Facebook ad variations more quickly and it makes creating a ton of Facebook ads very easy plus you can customize them. It has features to duplicate and do batch imports, target mobile and news feeds specifically. So it came highly recommended as a successful way to deal with Facebook. Um, did you want to talk about, I was going to say I can talk about donation pay. Um, when we talk about sending people to a donation form from your email and you want something customized, the guys at donation pay are really awesome. In they the girls, like <laughs> I think one of the co-founders is a woman um, and we've run into them at several of these nonprofit events and we work with them with some of our clients like Jim Haven has a donations pay form and it's when you really want to have that full custom um, integration with your donations form in your website uh, they're a great tool that we've gotten a lot of feedback from people that they like to use and I'm going to let Caitlin talk about some more of her favorite toys 
So I'm going to talk about the last two logos down on the bottom of this slide. The first one um, you probably recognize is Google Analytics. Google Analytics, and it's not necessarily a new tool, but we just wanted to include this because Google Analytics, for any of you guys who aren't familiar, google.com slash analytics, it's free uh, web monitoring or analytics tools for your website. And it is, like I said, it's free. It's from Google. It's the one that we've been using for years and years. And we just wanted to put it on there because it is not going away. <laughs> they are continuing to evolve. They're continuing to add new reports. You know, they changed the dashboard look completely in the last year or two. Um, Google Analytics is still kind of the leader in analytics. And the good news is that it's free. Um, the other good news for nonprofits is if you haven't checked out Google's Google for nonprofits yet, um, check that out. It's a, I think it's just google.com slash nonprofits. They have a lot of special tools that you can register. And pretty much as long as you're a 501c3, you can use these extra tools like um, for Google, for, um, you know, Google owns YouTube, so you can do branded YouTube pages and things like that that other organizations have to pay for that they're giving to nonprofits absolutely free. So check out Google for nonprofits. The last logo on this slide that you might not recognize is Razoo, and Razoo is Razoo.com. It's essentially like it's a crowdfunding source for donations. And the way that they work, it kind of reminds me of Kickstarter and um, in the way that people can set up kind of challenges and that you can raise money. And if you hit 100 percent, you know, you hit your challenge. Um, unlike Kickstarter, you do get all the money. I know on Kickstarter, you uh, the, a lot of the challenges are set up so that they only get the money if they reach 100 percent. But for Razoo, you know, it's nonprofit. So they'll they give all of the money that gets donated. The cool thing about Razoo that's a little different from some of the other ones I've seen is that they have the database of if you are a registered 501c3, you're already in their database. You don't have to do anything. Um, and so people can actually go set up a, a task or a project or a challenge on behalf of any 501c3 and raise money through Razoo. And then as a nonprofit, you can go through and kind of claim your page or um what they, I was talking to the girl on the showroom floor and she said that one of the first ways a lot of people hear about them is someone will donate to a cause and then Razoo sends the cause a check and then the people at the cause are like, what is this? I've like never heard of this before. And so uh, people, it's, it's kind of cool because it can run without your involvement, but if, as with anything, it's, it's probably better if you are involved. And so if you want to check out Razoo, look and see if anyone has, um, has, has been playing with it or has been using it with your organization. It's, it seems like a very cool tool. So we're getting close to wrapping it up and then we'll have time for questions. Uh, before we do, I really want to invite everyone here. If you're in Houston, come out on the second Tuesday of any month to the Houston Net Square group. You can find us on our meetup page to come to learn about upcoming events. There's our Facebook page. Net Squared is for people who are in nonprofit technology and nonprofit leadership roles or who are in social entrepreneurship or want to get involved as someone in technology and help nonprofits with their expertise to come together and connect and solve problems. They're part of TechSoup Global and there are Net Squared meetups all over the world. In case you're not in Houston, you can go to netsquared.org to find out more. So please come hang out. We would love to have you. Um, here's a bunch more resources of all of the different places that you can find uh, resources and tips or for nonprofit technology support. Um, and this concludes our presentation. We're going to stop the recording now and start taking questions.